When studying for your Security Plus, you're going to want to make sure that you do a lot of practice questions in order to really see if you understand the concept. Now, when I took this exam, the SYO 701, it was a lot of scenario-based questions. In fact, almost all of them were scenario-based questions. So in this video, we're going to be doing 50 of these practice questions. Now, I try to model it after what the actual exam will look like. If you can score an 80% on this, you're probably going to be good on studying for your exam. But I want to just remind you that this is just 50 questions and it doesn't cover every single thing in the exam objectives. Now the exam objectives is pretty vast and you can download it from CompTIA. It's absolutely free. Make sure you know everything in there. If you enjoy these 50 questions and you like the way I'm presenting it, please consider clicking on the links below. Check out my my Security Plus course on Udemy or other platforms. And also, I have a whole bunch of practice questions, about 550 of them, and this is just going to be 50 of them that you can also check out. Check the links in the description below. Also, if you like this video, give it a like, subscribe to the channel. Let's get started on our practice questions. So the first thing up we have, now I'm going to be reading the question for you, and then I'm going to be answering the question. Now, I want to point out that I'm not going to stop the video to read the questions as you guys can see that I have this uh, questions over here. Now, what I do want to point out is you should pause the video. As soon as I come to the question, go ahead and pause the video so you could see the question like the way I'm seeing it here. So pause it, answer it, and then let me read it and give you an explanation on it. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, it says a security technician observes that the data center's racks are all accessible to all employees, posing a risk to critical infrastructure. What is the most appropriate physical control to mitigate this risk? So first of all, you gotta understand, this is some kind of a physical problem. Notice it says the data center server rack. So this is the physical racks that holds the servers are accessible to all employees. So that's no, that's no good. What is the most appropriate, now notice it says, physical control. So in the exam objectives, there's different categories and types of control. Make sure you know what physical controls are. A, implement the network intrusion detection system, install locks on the server rack. C, update the antivirus software on the server, conduct a risk assessment. Now, let's go through this. The answer here is basically going to be uh, B. Why is it B? Well, pretty easy to understand. Here's why. Because notice it says physical control. Network intrusion detection system, that is a technical control. That's a piece of hardware and software. Antivirus is also a technical control. Why? Because that's also hardware and software, basically a piece of software. Conducting a risk assessment, this is more of an administrative operational control. This is more like policy-based things. So that is not considered a physical control. So for your exam, make sure you know different kinds of controls, different types of controls. This is one of the first things in your exam objectives. Practice question number two. A security professional notices an unusual pattern of outgoing traffic from a server hosting sensitive data. The traffic suggests potential data exfiltration. What technical control should be implemented immediately to best address this issue? So once again, it's a question about controls. Now, what is the problem here? Well, the problem here is that they're stealing data. Data is leaving the organization. So what can we do to stop this data? And in particular, make sure to read the question. They want a technical control. Install a firewall to monitor and control incoming and outgoing network traffic. That would actually solve the problem. The reason is because a firewall is a technical control. Conducted a security awareness training. This is more of an administrative control, so it's probably not that. Implement a biometric access to control the server room. This is more physical now because they're actually stopping someone from physically entering the server room and it wouldn't stop data from leaving the organization, outgoing traffic. So this one wouldn't even solve the problem. Review and update the company security policy is more of administrative control. Best answer here, once again, is going to be, where is that? Where's where that pen? Right there. Best answer here is going to be firewalls because firewall is considered a technical type control. Practice question number three. The company has faced several instances of tailgating where unauthorized individuals gain access by following employees into restricted area. Which deterrent, keep in mind deterrent control, would be effective in reducing the occurrence of tailgating? So remember what tailgating is. Tailgating is when you walk through a door and the door doesn't shut behind you 
and somebody walks in with you. Let's say you have to go through a door and you have to use your company badge to get in because it's a restricted area. So you put your, you, you place your badge, maybe it beeps you in and it opens and then you walk in and before the door locks, somebody walks in behind you. That's a form of tailgating. Now notice, it doesn't really want them to stop the tailgating, right? Notice the question is about deterrence. You have to understand what deterrent controls are. Deterrent controls are things that we're going to implement basically to scare people off from doing the bad task or the illegal task or the illegal activity. Install more surveillance cameras at all entry points. Okay, that's good. Implement stricter password policies. That's not going to help you here. The reason is because, notice, it's a deterrent control, and this is a physical problem. This is more of a technical thing. Conduct a security, regular security audits of the access control system. That, that's okay. Set up a software-based IPS. This is not going to work. This is a technical control, and this is more of a physical problem. So we can eliminate two. We can eliminate B and C. I'm sorry, B and D. But what about A and C? Now, notice, which one would scare people off? That's what you have to ask yourself. Which one of these choices would scare people off? And the best answer here that would scare people off is going to be A. You see, if you notice that there's cameras, let's say you're a bad person and you're trying to break into the building, and you notice that when you try to get in behind someone, you're on camera all the time. It may scare you off or quote unquote, detour you. But things like conducting regular security audits of the access control, you probably wouldn't even know that they're doing that. Let's say you're a bad person, you wouldn't even know they're doing that. So this probably wouldn't scare you off. Practice question number four. A smartphone user wants to access features not available in the standard operating system. What method would enable this. So in this particular one, let's say you have your cell phone and you want to install software, you want to manipulate the operating system, but the manufacturer is restricting you like you would see on an iPhone. Well, what can we do to ensure that we could gain access to all the administrative functions and install software maybe we shouldn't be installing? Exploiting database vulnerabilities? Probably not, as this would be something very difficult to do, and this would probably give you access more to data than it is the actual entire operating system. Utilizing scripting vulnerabilities, you really can't run many scripts on these phones. Jailbreaking is definitely the answer. So jailbreaking is basically a process where you overwrite or change the operating system on your mobile device in order to gain administrator functions on the device. And this is very popular in iPhones. And generally, generally iPhone is very restricted. You can't install uh, applications that Apple doesn't want you to install. But when you jailbreak it, you basically have full control over the phone and you can do whatever you like with it. Direct software installation. This here would be restricted as most iPhone would restrict you from doing this. So best answer here is jailbreaking. Now, when I took this exam, I had quite a few questions on this topic. So make sure you know it for your test. Practice question number five, a security professional is reviewing the security measures of a financial firm's data storage data storage system to ensure it aligns with the C and I of the CIA triad. Which of the following actions would best ensure adherence to the C and I? Now, you have to know CIA. What exactly is that? Now, before I start this, I want to mention that this exam is full of acronyms. Make sure you know your acronyms for your exam. So CIA stands for Confidentiality, Integrity, and Availability. So in this one, they're asking confidentiality and integrity. So C and the I, no availability here. So what can help us with basically confidentiality and integrity? Okay, so encrypting stored data. Okay, that works. Implementing a firewall that could probably help you with the C. Regularly updating software that could probably help you with the C and sometimes the I. Conducting background checks on employees' data, on, on con, con, background checks on employees. I'm not sure this is going to help you. So I'm going to eliminate that. Regularly updated software might stop your machines from getting hacked, but I'm not sure how it's going to really affect C in the eye. It could sometimes, or sometimes it cannot. So I put this. I put this question because I want to show you guys something. Sometimes you have choices that may answer the question somewhat. And then you have choices that is a better answer. So sometimes you're stuck between choices that are good and some choices are very good. Go with the very good answer. Data encryption in its native form is about confidentiality. When you encrypt data, only authorized people should be able to decrypt the data. So that's encrypting data. That serves the eye. Encryption also deals with hashing. 
Hashing is how we basically do data integrity for all systems. How do you track if data has been modified? Make a hash of the data. Make an A the best of these answers. Practice question number six. A security professional is tasked with identifying the discrepancies between the current security posture and the desired state of the security in their organization. Which process should the security professional undertake to identify these discrepancies? Risk analysis, gap analysis, penetration testing, or compliance auditing. Now, you notice the question basically tells you what it wants because you notice they say current security posture. This could be known as the current state. And you're trying to get to a desired state, right? So you want to go from current state to desired state. How do we get there? The best answer here is going to be gap analysis. Now, gap analysis is when you look at, well, I'm here and I want to go here. What's the gap between going here and here? So I'm, I'm 210 pounds right now and I want to be 180 pounds. So what's the gap? The gap is 30 pounds. A security professional looks at, we want to, right now our systems are here and we want to be here. That's the, you know, how do we fill this gap? So that's exactly what this is. Risk assessment is going to identify all the things that can affect your system, generally negative. Penetration testing will tell you, is your security controls working as they should? And compliance audit is basically going to tell you, basically, are you in compliance with certain laws and regulations? Practice question number seven. A security professional is enhancing the physical security measures of a corporate building located in a busy downtown area with a focus on mitigating vehicle-based threats. Which physical security measure is most suitable for protecting the building against potential vehicle ramming attacks while allowing pedestrian access? So basically you have a building and you're scared that vehicles are just gonna run into the building, right? Ram the building. But what can we do? When installing video surveillance cameras around the building, it's not gonna help you. You can put all the cameras you want. Cameras don't, cameras are deterrent and detective controls. Cameras are not preventive controls. They can't prevent an attack. If there's a camera here watching me right now, nothing, it can't stop me from stealing the microphone above me or taking this camera away from here. Cameras can't prevent me, but they could scare me. So this is more of a deterrent. It's not going to you know, stop the vehicle from ramming the building. Implementing an access control vestibule. Access control vestibules are done basically to stop people from tailgating or piggybacking into a building. Access control vestibule is when you walk, it's basically a two-door access. Let's say you want to get into a building, there's going to be two doors. You're going to open one, you're going to walk in, and you're probably going to have to authenticate somehow. Generally, somebody's going to have to watch you, you have to show a badge, you have to put in an ID code, and then if you do it right, then another door opens up. So this is going to stop tailgate. This is not for vehicle ramming a building. Erecting bollards. So bollards is what the answer here is, because what this is, is these are going to be those really, really big. And sometimes they come up to about four feet, five feet tall, sometimes three feet tall. There's a three, about three to four, five feet. And these come out of the ground. Sometimes you see them in front of big buildings and sometimes they put flowers in them. So these are these big circular uh, like cylinders that they put into the ground. That'll stop a vehicle from ramming into the building. Enhancing the lighting around the building. Lighting is not going to stop. It could be daylight. And the vehicle is still going to run into the building. Practice question number eight. A security technician is, pro is proposing the implementation of a new firewall system in the organization. The proposal includes significant changes to the current network infrastructure. Before implementing a new firewall, what is the first step the technician should do before installing the new system? So you're trying to get a new firewall system. What's the first thing you're going to do? Conduct an impact analysis of the new system on current operations. Okay. Obtaining formal approval of the project from senior management. Okay. Schedule a maintenance window for the implementation. No, you probably want to probably get approval or check the impact before that hour. Preparing a uh, back out plan. You would need approval before you even get to this one. So the best answer here is going to be obtaining approval for the project from senior management. Generally for projects to work before you actually before you conduct things, 
uh, such as coming up with a maintenance window or back out plan or anything, you need to get approval from that management because management needs to say, well, yeah, that makes sense to us or it doesn't make sense to us. So the best answer here is obtaining uh, approval from management, then doing A, C, and D. Practice question number nine, which of the following team combi combined does both offensive and defense testing of a company's network? Red teams, white teams, purple team, and uh, blue teams, and purple teams. So when you go work in security, you're going to find that if you work in, in pure security, not like your job is like help desk uh, and system administration, but in poor security, generally you work in blue or you work in red. So blue teams are teams that secure your networks. If you work security analyst, firewall administrator, you are part of the blue team. If you work as a pen tester, you're part of the red team. Combine them both, and maybe you have a small organization where most people does many things. If you're, if you're one security guy that does them both testing and securing, then you are known as part of the purple team. So the purple team is the guys that does red and blue. Notice if you combine red and blue, you get purple. Practice question 10. What should a security analyst do to ensure evidence is handled correctly? Chain of custody, collection, handover, and storage. So when you collect evidence, right, you're working as a security administrator, there's been some kind of hack within the business, something illegal that happened, and you have to preserve that evidence, right? You want to make sure that that evidence is collected correctly. You want to make sure it's stored correctly. You want to make sure that it is analyze correctly. You want to make sure that there is no quote unquote changes, the integrity of the evidence. The best way to do this is with the chain of custody. So while collecting the evidence, storing the evidence, and even hand over the evidence is important, this one here will do all of these. This is the better answer of all of these things. Remember, the chain of custody is basically a document that documents when the evidence was collected, how it was collected, who collected it, what they did with it, where they put it, how they analyzed it, who analyzed it, when they analyzed it, when they put it back, when it was presented to court, and so on. It basically keeps, it's the chain of everything that happened to the evidence. Ever watch a law show when they say something like, well, the evidence was tampered with, and now the evidence is thrown out. The chain of custody ensures there's no tampering or illegal kind of modification or modifications that shouldn't be done to the evidence. Question 11. Two security professionals are setting up a secure communication channel between their organizations. They need a secure way to establish a shared secret key for symmetric encryption. What method should they use to securely exchange the symmetric key? Now, I covered this extensively when I covered cryptography. And in cryptography, we talk about symmetric encryption. Even though symmetric encryption is incredibly secure and hard to crack, if not impossible, one of the problems is actually transferring that symmetric key because it is a shared key. So we do discuss this solution. So public key infrastructure for key exchange is not going to be the answer here. The reason is because this does more than just transfer a symmetric key. Digitally sending the symmetric key over email, you don't want that. Sending a symmetric key over email is going to expose it as email is generally sent in clear text. Using a asymmetric algorithm such as Duffy Hellman is going to be the best answer here. Asymmetric encryption is actually invented to pass symmetric keys. And one of the first one was the Duffy Hellman algorithm. Make sure you know your different kind of algorithms for your exam, such as RSA, ECC, Duffy Hellman are asymmetric. Things like uh, AES is going to be symmetric. So make sure you know your algorithms and know the pros and cons of symmetric versus symmetric versus hashing. Encrypting the key, the, the key using symmetric encryption and then sending it. Well, the, the whole point of it is they're trying to send the symmetric key. So encrypting it with another symmetric key is going to give you a problem. How do you send that key now? Question 12. A security professional is responsible for securely storing user passwords in a database. They need a method to protect the password from being exposed in case of a breach. What technique should the security professional use to safeguard user passwords in the database? Digital signatures, hashing, file permissions, and blockchain. Now, we covered this also in encryption. Almost all passwords in today's world should never be stored in clear text. In fact, those things are going to be stored in a hashing format. So basically, all passwords are basically hashed. Remember what hashing is? So basically, it's a one-way encryption. Basically, you're going to take data, create a cryptographic hash, 
and then that hash represents the data. If the data change, the hash will change. All passwords in today's world is hashed. Learn more in the course. Now, a digital signature is not going to help. Even though a digital signature contains a hash, it is encrypted with a sender's private key. So there's nothing here but send in data. It's just about passwords. File permission. File permission is not going to help. As notice, it says storing the passwords in a database. The database will then need access, not a user. Generally, file permission is going to be for user access. A blockchain doesn't hide anything. Everything on a blockchain is actually exposed, even though it does use hashing to keep track of the blockchain. Question 13. A security professional is managing a network with multiple SSL TLS secured devices. They need a mechanism to promptly revoke the trust of, of a compromised certificate across all devices. What technology should the professional use to maintain a list of revoked certificates that can be checked by clients? Now, this one here is a pretty simple one because the answer is basically going to be certificate revocation list. Notice it does say that is revoked certificates. Now, sometimes the exam is not going to be as clear cut as this. I left this in here to show you guys that some, sometimes the questions are very easy, but sometimes they'll say that the certificate would compromise. What technology should be used? Well, a certificate revocation list. A revocation list is basically going to be a list of all compromised certificates that a certificate authority has issued. So if your certificate of a compromise, it's going to appear on this list so people know not to use it. A self-signed certificate is not a compromised certificate. It's a certificate generated in inside of an organization for generally that organization usage. A certificate signing request is what you send to a CA to get your certificate signed. And a third-party certificate will come from places such as GoDaddy. It's a third-party certificate, not an internal certificate, such as a self-sign. Practice question 14. A security technician has noticed unusual behavior from an employee who has access to sensitive customer data. The employee actions are suspicious, indicating pot potential malicious intent. What type of threat actor is the employee most likely categorized as? Now, in the exam objective for this course, there is a list of different kinds of threats that you can have. Make sure you know them. And this is the list. These are the list of some of them. Notice this one. This one here, the employee actions. So that tells me right away that this is going to be somebody inside of the organization, which is an insider threat. Organized crime is going to be groups of people that are generally organized. Think of the mobster here that tries to break in, create malware, and create chaos, or steal data from businesses. Nation states, for example, Russia having problems with the United States. Russia would be considered a nation state trying to hack the United States. Hacktivist is basically an activist, somebody who has a strong political belief, but then using hacking in order to push their beliefs. So that's a hacktivist. Question 15. What type of cyber attack occurs when employees of a company is tricked by a fake website that looks legitimate? Identity theft, misinformation, water and hole, or spear phishing. Now, notice in the question it says employees. That means many of the employees is probably visiting a particular website, and the website is trying to trick them to steal their information or steal some kind of data from them or do something malicious to them. This basically describes what is known as a water and hole attack. Water and hole attack basically comes from literally the word water and water and hole. Think of a a desert where you have alligators inside of a of, a, of like a little trench, and the alligators live there. When the animals comes to drink water, the alligator bites them and kills them. This is the same kind of concept of a water and hole attack. Attacker sets up a website that looks good that targets a set of particular folks or a set of employees from a company. Anytime the employees visit there to get information or to collaborate with each other, they basically steal the information or have them click on links to install malicious malware. In the term, water and hole. So notice, it's basically people are coming and then they're getting bitten by the alligators, just like like the uh, other animals that would come to drink water from a water and hole. This is not about identity theft. There's nothing in the question that says they're stealing people's personal information. There's no misinformation. There's nothing here but them getting false information. And spear phishing is basically them sending you emails that is targeted just to you versus that's not going to be this because this here says employees that are targeting a large group of people. 16. To quickly address the security vulnerability found in the firmware of an IoT device, what is the most effective action? Conduct a risk analysis, patch in, network restructuring, or device upgraded. Now, 
you want to make sure that you understand that what is IoT device? IoT devices are anything that basically connects to the internet. Think of your, your TV, your fridge, your coffee maker, your watch. Any device that basically connects to a network is considered some form of an IoT device. Anytime there's a vulnerability found on these devices, the best thing to do is, of course, to patch the device. Patching the device is going to remove the vulnerability. Hopefully, the manufacturer knows about this particular vulnerability. Conducting a risk assessment is going to help identify all the things that could affect it. Network restructuring should not help this. Because if you leave the vulnerability, it can still be affected. You restructuring your network and not fixing the vulnerability leaves it vulnerable. Device upgrading, I'm not sure how that's going to help. You change the device, upgrading the device may remove the vulnerability, but the best thing here to do is just to patch it to remove that vulnerability right away, not just change the device. Question 17. <clears throat> A security professional has noticed an increase in phone calls to employee where the caller poses as IT support staff and requests sensitive information such as login credentials. Some employees have unknowingly provided this information. What technique is most likely being used to deceive employees through phone calls? Now, keep in mind, this is something actually very common. Things These what attackers would do. This is considered a form of social engineering to steal your credential. Now, it gives you a large part of what the answer is by right at the bottom where it says phone calls. So if it's a phone call, it's something that pick up the phone and speak. So things like typo squatting, water and hole attacks is not going to work. Typo squatting is when you mistype someone's domain name and it takes you to a bad website. In other words, they register mistyped domain names and create malicious websites. When you mistype it, you're going to go to a bad website. Water and hole attack is when you set up a website that a lot of companies or a lot of particular people from a company go to or a group of people go to and then you infect their machines or you steal their data. Whaling is when you go after the CEO or the big fish in the business. You're basically fishing the big fish in the business. It's considered whaling. Vision is voice fishing. This is the only choice that deals with phone calls making this, this the best answer. And just like phishing, when they send you an email to steal your data, vision is basically them calling you to steal your information. Question 18. To identify the creator and creation date of a suspicious file found on a server, what should a security analyst check? The file's hash value, network activity logs, server access logs, files, metadata. Now, First thing up, we can eliminate the hash. Hash values is only going to show you if the file has been modified or changed. Network activity logs is going to show you network traffic across the network. Server access log is going to say who accessed the server. None of these things would say who created the file. The file's metadata would, would say who the creator was, when it was created. You can access file metadata by just right-clicking a file on your computer, go to properties, and you see all the different tabs there, when it was created, when it was modified, and some of them have additional properties saying who the creator was, making D the best answer. Question 19. A security professional is responsible for managing the virtualized infrastructure of a large organization. They have heard about the concept of virtual machine escape and its potential security problem. What term, what does the term virtual machine escape refer to in the context of virtualization? So they're basically asking, what is VM escape? The process of m migrating a virtual machine from one host to another? No, that's literally called virtual machine migration or movement. That's all that is. A security breach where a malicious attacker gains control of the whole system from within a virtual machine? Correct. So virtual machine escape is when they execute a code in the VM to get over to the hosted machine. For example, let's say you have VirtualBox installed on your computer. Let's say you have a Windows box and you install VirtualBox. Now imagine a malicious code executes in one of your VMs. That code that you execute, a malicious code that executed in the VM, is now able to infect the host machine and take control of the host machine. That's what VM escape is. That's what it's describing. A practice of cloning virtual machines? No, it's nothing used for backups. The deployment of virtual machines across multiple physical hosts, for, that's called load balancer. So the best thing here, this is a kind of malicious attack. Make sure you go through your exam objectives. All those attacks, you need to know what they are. Now, don't forget, I also 
in the description below, I have a link to a quick study guide. It's only 99 cents on Amazon that goes through, gives you a brief description of all the exam objectives. So you can check that out also. It's only 99 cents, less than the price of a coffee nowadays. Question 20. An organization wants to enhance its security measures to prevent employees from inadvertently installing harmful application. What is the most effective strategy? Regular malware scans, VPN implementations, implementing an application allow list and user access list. Best answer here is going to be an application allow list. Now, this is something that organizations should have. Basically, it's what it says it is. It's a list of application that these are the only apps that you can have allow, that you can have installed on your computer. Everything else is disallowed. So this would ensure that if somebody wants to install application A, they're gonna check the list. Is that on the list? No, okay, I can't do that. Regular malware scan is not gonna work on this one. The reason is because if the application is not malware, it wouldn't detect it. A VPN is used to connect to remote sites. User access control basically is to control what people have access to, not what they can really install. Question 21. A security technician notices that a piece of malware is rapidly spreading through the organization network, creating copies of itself, notice creating copies of itself, and consuming network resources. What type of malware is described in this scenario? Now, the scenario describes a worm attack known for its ability to replicate. Correct. So worms are basically self-replicating. That's different than a virus. Most viruses need you to do something to make it replicate. The scenario describes a Trojan attack known for a deceptive appearance. Trojans, when you get a Trojan, it basically looks like legitimate mal, like a legitimate piece of software. Like you may go to a website and it'll say, here's a free antivirus software, and it looks like free antivirus, and it may come with a company name that sounds good, but it's not. It's basically a virus. But in this one, notice it's just creating copies of itself. So it's basically replicating itself. Describe spyware for its rapid spread. Spyware does not rapidly spread. It generally infects one machine and it just watches all your activity. A logic bomb known for consuming. Logic bomb may or may not consume large network resources. Logic bomb needs a detonation point. It's a software you download. It's a malicious software on a computer that after a certain time it, des it, it detonates and blows up. It has some kind of generally like a timer, like you download it, you install you get infected, not download it. So let's say you get infected, and then like six months later, that's going to be a time one. Six months later, it, des it, it detonates and wipes out all your data. Another thing a logic bomb could do it after if you go to a particular website that can activate it and can steal your data, like, you, like you're going to a banking website. So this doesn't describe that. This is more of a worm attack. Make sure you know the difference between these things, such as Trojans, worm. Virus, logic bomb, spyware for your exam as these are right out of those exam objectives. A security engineer notices that several logs from a critical network devices, such as firewalls and intrusion detection systems, are missing for a period of several hours. That's not good. During which, during which a security incident may have occurred. What should the security engineer do to address it? See, if you have missing log files, that's generally not a good thing. Missing log indicate that the devices were not generating any data. You always generate data on a network. Missing log can be a sign of security incidents or a potential uh, breach of the logging system. The security engineer should investigate the cause of the missing logs. Yes. Now, let me, let me ex explain something to you. Anytime an attacker comes into an organization and steals data, one of the things they want to do is to not get caught. And one of the ways for them to clear their tracks is to delete the log files. If you have gaps in your log files, that can indicate that something malicious was going on and nobody wants you to, the, the attackers or the bad people don't want you to see what they were doing. The missing logs are a result of log rotation? Not really. You Log rotation, you should still archive them. The published documentation regarding log storage is accurate and no action, no. You need to take action if you are missing log files. Practice question 23, a security administrator responsible for securing servers in a data center. They implement a security measure to control incoming and outgoing network traffic on each server to protect against unauthorized access and network-based attacks. What hardening technique is a security administrator primarily implementing? 
default password changes, host based firewall encryption, removal of unnecessary software or necessary software features. Now, you got to read this one carefully. You notice it says traffic on each server to protect against unauthorized access and network attacks. So what can prevent network attacks on each machine? Best answer is a host based firewall. Now, in the world of firewall, you have what's called network based firewall and host based firewall. You probably have that at home. If you have like your router that your ISP sent you, that's going to be your network based firewall. But then if you use like a Windows box and you have Windows firewall turned on, that's going to be a host based firewall that protects the individual computer against attacks within the network. There's nothing here about password changes or data needing to be encrypted. And there's nothing here about software being removed. So best answer, host based firewall. Practice question 24. What is the primary characteristics of an on-premises architectural model for hosting servers and data? Now, on-prem basically means that you're storing data on your physical premises. In the world of security or IT, there's what we call off-prem and on-prem. Off-prem is generally when you store data in the cloud. On-prem is when you store data in your local physical data centers. So it's not reliance on a third party. That would be cloud. It's not distributing the data. It's about hosting data and servers within a physical facility, generally within your data center. Serverless computing is when you generally get cloud services where the cloud provider maintains the server for you and you just need to use it. It's called serverless. Question 25. A security technician is responsible for implementing a threat detection mechanism in an ICS used for managing a city's water treatment plant. Stop right here. What is ICS? You need to know acronyms for your exam. They're on the exam, they're going to acronym galore you. They're going to kill you with acronyms. You need to know them. They're in the exam objective. The study guide, my course, all goes through all the acronyms. If you don't want to get my course, check the obje exam objective. ICS means industrial control systems. Industrial control systems are things like power plants, water supply systems, <clears throat> gas supply systems, and so on. So in this one, they're talking about water treatment. What threat detection mechanism is essential for monitoring and alerting on suspicious activities in the ICS environment? So which one here is going to tell us there's a problem going on? Email filtering? Well, there's nothing here about email. We're not talking about removing viruses here. We're talking about monitoring and alerting. The best thing here that's going to tell us that something is going on is going to be an IDS system. IDS systems, if there's an intrusion, it'll send you an alert that says, hey, this machine over here is being has a potential intrusion. MDM, mobile device management. This is only for like cell phones. Mobile device is not a water treatment plant. Now, on the exam, they might not give you, they might not spell out the word IDS. They may just say IDS and MDM, and you have to know what they mean. All right, we're at the halfway point, and I just want to give you guys a quick reminder. If you're really enjoying this video, if you can give me a like, it would be absolutely amazing. Subscribe to the channel for more content like this to help you guys pass your exam. We do, lots of times, we do giveaways of all of our CompTIA classes that we have on all of our different platforms, including all the practice questions and stuff like that. And if you really enjoy the way I'm teaching, check out my Security Plus class in the description below. I think it's a great class. Comes with tons of resources. Check it out. See if you like it. Let's get back to the questions. Question 26. An organization requires a way to monitor changes in its network environment. What system should be implemented? Firewall, intrusion prevention, network access control, and file integrity monitoring. Now, this one here is pretty simple if you understand the part here that says monitoring changes. Because anytime you want to check if something changed, the best thing to do is to see its integrity. Remember, integrity by its definition is what has changed. A firewall would stop ac basically access into a machine, bad access, like, a, like network attacks. Prevention will stop bad things from happening to your machine. Network access control will stop computers that don't meet a certain criteria, such as not being updated, and joining your network. File integrity, if there's anything that changes on a computer, any kind of file that changes, especially in applications, file integrity monitoring will actually tell you what has changed. And notice they, they require a way to monitor any changes. So best answer is D. Question 27. To enhance network security, what change should a security analyst recommend if a remote desktop service 
is accessible from the internet. Now, remote desktop is great. I use it a lot, especially when I'm home or even when I'm away, I wanna be able to access my desktop and work like I'm sitting at my desktop. Never open remote desktop to the public at any point. Never do that. Implement Implementing stronger encryption against remote desktop would still make it accessible throughout the world. Don't do that. The best thing here to do is to set up a VPN to your network and then remote desktop over that VPN. That way the remote desktop is not accessible to anyone unless they have a VPN connection. Changing the default port. A port scanner can still find the ports and then they can try all the different ports that you change it to. So that's not going to help you. Making a password complex still opens up remote desktop and a good password cracker will probably still be able to crack it. So get a VPN going. Not only is this going to encrypt it, but it's going to give it much more security. Question 28. A large e-commerce platform wants to ensure uninterrupted service even during peak shopping seasons. Which approach should a security professional recommend to achieve high availability? Load balancing, hot site, geographic spreading, continuity of operation. So a couple of quick things. Notice they say during peak shopping season. That means they're getting a lot of traffic. If you're getting a lot of traffic, you're going to bog down one machine. You want to be able to have multiple machines so they could load balance. They can disperse the traffic across multiple computers. Load balance. And a hot site is if your main site goes down, a hot site within a few hours can come back up. But there's going to be somewhat of a downtime. Not the best answer. Geographic dispersing or spreading is when you spread it. When you, when you have multiple data centers, you don't want all your data centers in one location. You may want a data center in New York, one in the middle of the country, one in California. So if there is any attack against major environmental attack or problem in one section of the country, it doesn't affect all your, all your data centers. Continuity of operation is document how you would get a, how you would continue to work in case there's a major disaster. But in this one here, they're trying to look at peak traffic, load balancing, best option. Question 29, a company wants to ensure that only authorized devices can connect to switch ports. What security measures should they deploy in the switch to achieve this? Intrusion detection, network access control, uh, SSL, or VLAN? Best answer here, guys, is going to be, in this scenario, network access control. So here's what this is. Let's say you come to my house and I have this thing in, in, uh, enabled and you plug your computer into my switch. The switch will then pass it off to a radius server. It utilizes a protocol 802.1x, and it's going to check your computer to see if you have updates, if you have antivirus, and if you meet my security policy, quote unquote, security policy, uh, I'm going to allow you to join my network. That's what network access control is. Intrusion prevention system would only stop an intrusion. It doesn't stop you from joining the network. SSL is used to encrypt data across the network. It wouldn't stop you from joining the network. VLANs, it wouldn't stop you from joining the network, but whatever port you're in would restrict what data you can access or what segment of the network you're in. Practice question number 30. A security technician is conducting a code review for a software development project. They want to identify and mitigate potential vulnerabilities in the application source code. What technique should the security technician employ to identify and mitigate security vulnerabilities in the source code? So notice they're looking at problems in the source code itself. Implement input validation. Input validation would stop things from coming into the application. This would stop things like SQL injection or buffer overflows, cross-site scripting. This is when people type malicious codes into the application field. It's not going to look at the source code. Secure uh, cookies. Secure cookies is going to pass data around the application or within the application more securely. If you want to look at the application source code, do static analysis. Static code analysis is reviewing the actual source code itself for vulnerabilities. Now, static analysis, is its opposite is going to be dynamic code testing, a dynamic dynamic analysis, in which case you run the code and you run the application. Code signing is just seeing if the code has been modified and where it came from. Best answer, C. Question 30. A security professional is responsible for maintaining an accurate inventory of software licenses within the organization. They discovered that some software licenses had expired, but the software is still in use. What action should a security professional take to address the issue 
of expired software licenses. Implement data retention policies. Uh, schedule the destruction of the software with the expired license. Initiate the acquisition procurement process for a new software license. Disable the software. Okay, if, you, if you're an organization and you see that some of the software, the license has lapsed, right? Hopefully they're not illegal, right? That you just lapsed, you didn't renew them. The best thing to do is to get them renewed, right? So initiate the acquisition procurement process for the new software license. Implementing data retention for this is not gonna this is not gonna help to fix the licensing issue. Schedule the destruction of the software. Well, if you destroy the software, it might destroy data and interrupt the entire organization's uh, working. Disable the software is basically B. If you stop the software, it might disable the way the company works. Question 32. In a penetration test and engagement, what document typically outlines the estimated time required for the test? This is exactly what your exam looks like. When I took this particular test, these were the type of choices I would get. They would just be a whole bunch of acronyms. So NDA, non-disclosure agreement, service level agreement, business partnership agreement, statement of work. So you need to know these acronyms. Answer here, the statement of work. Basically, what are we going to get done? How long is it going to take? Things like that are going to be in the statement of work. Business partnership is when companies combine together what, who's going to do what, in order to accomplish a specific endeavor. Service level agreement is gonna be like they need to have a 99.99% uptime. This is a heavy, just as generally a performance thing. NDA is don't give away information. If I work with you and you sign NDA, whatever we do, you can't tell the public about it. Question 33, a security technician is tasked with identifying and responding to security alerts generated by the organization's systems and applications. What tool or technology should the security technician rely on to receive real-time security alerts from systems? Security content automation protocol, antivirus, SIEM systems, a security information event. Keep in mind, once again, guys, the exam may just give you the acronym. They probably wouldn't spell it out. Archiving tool. Now, in this particular one, security content automation, antivirus, and archiving tool is not going to give you these real-time security alerts. The best thing for that is going to be a SIEM system. What exactly is this? This is like Splunk, very famous software. What this does, it basically is a log capture in software. Basically what it does is that it's going to capture all the logs within the business in a real-time fashion. And if there's any kind of malicious problems with these logs, it then tells you that. It sends you an alert in real-time. says it is a problem in this particular system. We can see. Best answer. Question 34, what are the best ways to ensure only authorized personnel can access a secure research facility? Now, keep in, way, keep in mind that you got to select two. You are going to have questions on the exam where they're going to tell you to select two or three. You do have quite a few choices. Let's see what the answer here is. Now, it's going to be C and D. Notice can access a secure research facility. Perimeter fencing. Perimeter fencing is the out interior fence of the actual facility. This is going to stop them from even entering the grounds, not just the facility. CCT monitoring is camera monitoring. CCT monitoring, cameras really is not going to stop you from accessing a particular facility. Motion detectors can detect movement. This is going to alert somebody's coming in. Visitor sign in logs. This is people just signing on a piece of paper. The best thing here is a badge access system. In other words, to get into this particular door, you need to have a particular badge. Maybe you beep it in with an RFID. Uh, control access vestibule or access control vestibule. What these are, these are going to be double doors. They used to be called man traps a long time ago. So you may see this in like a prison, some of those prison movies. In order to get into the actual prison, you got to, you go through one door. The door locks. Security guard checks your ID. Uh, or sometimes you may have to put in Sometimes they have codes that you got to type in there or some kind of biometric that you have to th that you have to authenticate to and then the second door opens up. So in this one nobody can get in unless their IDs are checked or, or maybe their bad system is checked. Making these two best answer. Question 35, a security technician needs to ensure that privileged users have temporary and limited access to sensitive data when needed. What privilege access management tool or concept should the security technician implement? to grant privileged users temporary limited access 
tokenization, biometric, password managers, just-in-time permission. Now, notice it says in the question, have temporary and limited access. Temporary and limited access. So something is temporary and limited, this is called just in time. In other words, the permission is just in time for when they need it. After they don't need it, it goes right away. Tokenization. Tokenization replaces data with tokens, and then that data, that token then represents the data, hiding the data. Biometric is used to login in. There's nothing here about logging in anything. Password managers is used to manage passwords. There's nothing here about a password issue. Question 36, a security technician is implementing automation to scale the organization's infrastructure in a secure manager and peak usage period. What benefit What benefit of uh, automations on orchestration? Standard infrastructure configuration, cost reduction, scaling in a secure manner, employee reduction. This is more of a management question because why would you want to do automation and orchestration? So, Here's what this is. Automation orchestration is when there's a security incident, there's an automated and fast, basically a quick automated response. When there's a security incident, the faster we respond to them, the less bad they are to us, the less data is stolen, the less systems go down. The faster systems can come up, the faster we respond. The whole point of doing this is basically cost reduction. One of the main reasons we automate things here is to reduce overall costs, making that the best answer. Question 37, a security profession is investigating a suspicious, a suspected security breach in the organization's web application. What type of data source is most likely to contain information about user actions, errors, and events related to web application? So notice they're saying what type of a log data source. So is it Application log, endpoint logs, dashboards, or vulnerability scans. First thing up I can tell is that vulnerability scan is going to show you problems or errors or vulnerabilities on an application. It's not going to say who accessed what. A dashboard is basically an interface to something. So is it application or endpoint logs? Answer. Application logs. Endpoint logs is basically the log files from your endpoint software. Endpoint software is Things like Semantics Endpoint, McAfee Endpoint. These are basically antivirus and firewalls, intrusion prevention and detection systems all packaged into one. So that's not going to say who accessed what application, what they did with it, what was their action. But an application log is going to say Bob accessed it at this time from this time. They can be best answer. Question 38. What is most likely to be used in a company to document risks? assign responsibilities, and define threshold. Definition of risk tolerance, process of risk transfer, maintenance of a risk register, conducting a risk analysis. Now, in the exam objective, we specifically talk of something we call a risk register. A risk register holds all the documented risks. It's basically, register basically means list. So when you think register, think list. So how do you document risk? List the risk. That's why risk register. It also can say, what are we going to do about it? Who's responsible to fix it? And so on. Risk tolerance is the maximum risk you're willing to take for a, um, for a reward. Risk transfer is just a response. There's nothing here about it being a response. And conducting a risk analysis, how you analyze it. This is not about analysis. This is, a, this is documented risk. Where are we going to store that? Question 39. A security professional notices that an unauthorized device has been used to copy the signals from legitimate RFID tags, allowing unauthorized access to a secure area. What type of physical attack is described in the scenario? And how does it work? Environmental attack, brute force attack, cloning attack, social engineer. Best answer here, guys. Notice it says copy the signal from an RFID tag. This is called RFID cloning. RFID cloning is when they come up to you and let's say you have an RFID tag or, or card in your wallet. They come up to you, they use a device to steal the RFID signal from your device and then they can then put that onto another card or tag and then utilize that to impersonate you. That's what that is. It's not a brute force attack. This is a multiple tries. This environmental attacks are going to be things like Within the physical environment, this is against RFID tags. Social engineering is people like it's people trying to hack you. This is literally a hardware-based thing. Question 
Number 40. We got 10 more to go out of it. A security technician discovers that an attacker has gained access to a network and positioned himself in a way that allows them to intercept and manipulate network traffic. What type of attack is described in this scenario? How is the attacker positioned? So this particular one, the attacker is in a position that they're intercepting all the traffic and then they can manipulate it and then send it back out. So they're in the middle between somebody maybe sending and somebody receiving the data. This is known, used to be known as man in the middle. For your exam, it's now known as an on-path attack. This is the exact what it is. An on-path attack is when an attacker sits between the communication between senders and receivers, getting the data, manipulating the data, and then sending it over to the receiver. The receiver of the data believes it's coming from a particular sender, but it's not. It's coming from the attacker. This describes a malicious code attack. No, it's basically somebody sitting in between it. This describes a rootkit. Rootkits are installed on a machine to give normal user accounts a higher level of privilege. It basically takes a normal user account and turns them into root accounts or administrator. Keep in mind, root accounts, a root is the administrator on Linux. A scenario describes a security professional conduct. This is not a pen test. This is literally an attacker doing something. Once again, if you're finding value in this video, I would really appreciate a like, subscribe to the video. We have much more content like this coming up. Let's get back to the questions. An organization enforces mobile device management uh, policies to secure, secure and manage employee-owned smartphones and tablets. In the context of mobile device, what is the organization primarily achieving when enforcing MDM for employee-owned smartphones? Secure data destruction, data encryption, endpoint security, risk acceptance. This is kind of a tricky question. I also want to point out that once again, I know I'm a broken record, but the, the exam may not tell you that MDM stands for mobile device management. So in this particular, when you install MDM, MDM is considered a kind of an endpoint security software. Remember, endpoint is any, endpoint is all devices in a network. Any device in a network can get hacked. So when you install something to secure that, it's considered a kind of an endpoint. There's nothing here but data destruction. Even though MDMs have the ability to remotely wipe data, they're not talking about that in this one. There's nothing here about that. Data encryption. MDM does allow data to be encrypted on the device, but that falls into endpoint security. Risk acceptance. They're not accepting any risk. That's why they are basically installing MDM. Question 42. What type of reconnaissance activities a security professional primarily engaged in when gathering information with potential vulnerabilities on the organization's on the organization's external network by reviewing job postings or message boards about the company. Passive reconnaissance, active reconnaissance, def defend defensive penetration testing, known environmental testing. Best answer here, pretty simple. Notice they're going looking at job posting or message boards about the company. They're not actually engaging with the company. They're mostly grabbing and learning about the company. This is called passive reconnaissance. So reconnaissance is finding information about a, a, a target that you're trying to hack. Let's say you're a pen tester and you got to pen test my business. And you're going to go and look at maybe my latest job posting to see what technology I use. Maybe you're going to look at all my LinkedIn profile. Maybe you might browse my website and things like that. That's active. Passive. That's uh, passive reconnaissance. Active reconnaissance is when maybe you call my company and actively engage with me to try to find out more information. Def this is defensive penetration testing, really not a thing. Th there is such a thing as defensive uh, defensive methods. Known environmental testing, this is when you're testing against particularly known threats. There's nothing here but testing. They're literally just gathering information. Question 43. An organization implements MFA for its employees' access to sensitive systems and resources. What security measure is the organization primarily implemented when implementing MFA? Threat analysis, user authentication, security awareness training, access control. So I didn't put in the uh, what MFA stands for in this one. I wanted to see if you guys know. If you know, the answer is pretty obvious. MFA stands for multi-factor authentication. You can this the best answer. MFA is when you're going to use more than one factor. Remember, there's multiple factors that you can use to log into a machine. Something you know, which is like a password. Something you have, which can be like a bank card or a smart card. 
and something you are, such as a biometric. You can also do some where you are and a few others. So in this one, you're going to use multiple factors. Maybe you're going to use a, a, a thumbprint and a password. So that would be two factors that falls into the fact to the realm of multi-factor authentication. There's nothing here but threats or security trainer or access control. Question 44. A security technician analyzes network traffic logs to identify patterns indicative of potential, keyword, distributed denial of service. In the context of threat detection and analysis, what action is a security technician primarily taken when analyzing traffic logs to identify patterns indicative of potential intrusion prevention, threat hunting, risk analysis, risk mitigation? Now, notice they're going through the logs to see was there any kind of attack against her network. What are they doing? They're hunting for threats that may have attacked your network or is going to be attacking your network. That's called threat hunting. Intrusion prevention is doing something to stop an intrusion. Risk analysis is identifying risk. And this is how you respond, mitigation, respond to risk. There's nothing here about risk. They're just basically reviewing log files here. Question 45. An organization enforces mobile device encryption policies to ensure that data stored on the employee's smartphones and tablets is protected from unauthorized access. Case of loss. What security measure is the organization primarily implementing? Data integrity, confidentiality, availability, and authentication. So this is the whole CIA plus authentication. So you will need to know that. Notice it says in case of device loss or theft. So if the device is lost and they're able to get the hard drive, what must you have done to the hard drive? Well, I hope you encrypted that hard drive with data confidentiality. Hopefully you have good user login, such as a good password. Data integrity is going to see if the data has been manipulated. Availability, this is going to make sure the data is available when people need it. Authentication is people logging in. Although that can help, encryption is a form of confidentiality. Question 46. A security technician is responsible for designing the network infrastructure of a critical government agency. They're required to ensure that sensitive systems are physically isolated from the rest of the network to prevent unauthorized access. Which network design technique should the security technician implement to achieve physical isolation? So physical isolation is when you break it off the actual network. So things like logical segmentation, which is what you would do if you implement VLANs across a switch. SDN may or may not segment the network, but SDN basically is managing network traffic using software-based controllers. This optimizes network traffic. Virtualization is all software-based. If you want to physically break a network off, you would air gap in. Air gap in, let's say you have your entire network set up. You have switches connected to switches and you VLAN it, but you got a really particular secure system that only certain people should have access to. You would air gap it. Basically, you would set up another network and there would be no physical connection between your new secure network or your air gap system and your other network. Literally, there is air, like oxygen, between your the switch on your main network and the switch on your air gap system. In the term air gap, because it's literally air. There's no physical connection between them. And to get data on an air gap system, you actually have to walk over to it and connect to it. Question 47, a bank requires all of its vendors to implement measures to prevent data loss on a stolen laptop. What strategies is the bank demanding? Disk encryption, data permission, uh, information categorization, access right limitation. So if you lose your laptop, which I've done once, lost a really important laptop. It's a really important data, but it didn't bother me too much. The reason is because my laptop had BitLocker disk base encryption. So here's what this is. Let's say you have important data on your laptop and you lose it. They don't need to have your password, which is what access right limitation is, or it doesn't matter what type of permission is on that data. So that would be A and D. And it doesn't matter how it's classified. If they can just open up the laptop, take out the hard drive and mount the hard drive onto another machine, they can access all your data on your C drive, D drive and whatever without ever logging in. But if the data is encrypted, this base encryption, when they take out the hard drive and they mount it, they would still need the de decryption key to access your data, making A the best answer. And if you have a laptop that you walk around with, 
make sure that you have this basic encryption enabled on your laptop. 48, to ensure software code uh, authenticity in a, in a development environment, what method should a software development, software development manager implement? So remember, authenticity is like, do we know it actually, does this code actually come from Microsoft? Does, does this script come from Cisco? How do we know that? The best way to know that is, is the code sign. Code sign-in uses a digital signature. We covered that in the course. Digital signatures in order to determine who it came from. So the sender of the code or to make it a code would digitally sign in. If I digitally sign something, you're 100% sure it came from me and was never modified. Regularly, code reviews wouldn't verify where it came from. Dynamic application testing would test if the code is good, but it wouldn't say who it came from. Agile methodology is how is a methodology used to make and, and write codes. 49. In a corporate network, the IT department wants to implement a solution that divides the network based on security requirements. What mitigation technique is the IT department planning to implement? Least privileges, patching, segmentation, encryption. In this one here, notice they're dividing the network. If you're dividing your network, you are segmenting it. The best way to segment your network is the utilization of VLAN. Name in the VLAN, things like finance, accounting, management, and so on. Least privileges, this is, you should follow the principles of least privileges on a per user basis. In other words, this user should only have access to this data based on what they need to do their job. Patching is keeping your machine updated, encryption, hiding data from people that don't need to see it. All right, before we get to the last question, one more time, if you guys can please click on the like button. My legs are killing me standing here talking for what's going on near the two hours. Yeah, I did mess up some of those questions, so they have to reframe them. Please click on the like button, subscribe to the channel, it would be amazing, and also check out my courses. All right, last question. Security protocols in a cloud data center are under review to guarantee the protection of the safety of the data, data center staff. Which of the following best illustrates the appropriate uh, setup for these security controls? Now notice, look at the terms, look at the keywords. When you do your exam, read carefully. Security of the data center staff, okay? Data center staff. So notice the data center staff, things I can eliminate right away. User authentication systems, external gateways. This is all like firewalls, data access logs. This is not gonna help me. When it comes to the security, you're thinking more of a physical thing. The answer here is gonna be, and I'm gonna explain this one, fire safety mechanism should fail open. You guys want to understand what is fail close versus fail open. This is on the exam objective. Now, what is that? Fail open is when a system fails, it unlocks and allows anything in and out. Fail close is when a system fails or crashes, it locks up. For example, an external gateway access point should fail close. Yes, here's why. If a firewall ever fails, the firewall should lock. Nothing comes in, nothing comes out. That's known as a fail close. If the firewall fails open, when the firewall crashes, not if, when it crashes, it allows all traffic in and out. Which one would you want? Which you think is more secure? But when it comes to human safety, notice the safety. Fire safety mechanism should fail open. That way, if there's any kind of fire mechanism, specific door locks and all this kinds of stuff, when the system fails, all the doors in the data center should open up. That doesn't sound good, right? Because then anybody can get in and out. Correct, because there's a fire in the data center. If there's a fire in the data center, all the security mechanisms should just open up so people can get in and out. The fire department can get in and out. So make sure you know this definition of fail, fail close and fail open for your exam. All right, that was my 50 question. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Once again, if you can please click on the, the like button, subscribe to the channel. We have a lot more content. We're gonna be doing a ton of giveaways. Uh, in the in the months that are coming up. So subscribe to get all the giveaways that we're going to be giving out. They're not unlimited giveaways, so make sure you subscribe. And the moment you see the videos come out, click on it. Now, also, if you're interested in passing your Security Plus, if you like the way I explain things, hopefully you did, check out my courses. I do have 600 of these practice questions in the link below. Check those out uh, for my Security Plus practice questions. I have a full-length course. It's nearly 30 hours of content where I explain every single one of those exam objectives to you. And also, I wrote a study guide that I wanted to give away. 
I put it on Amazon and I made it exclusive to them. And then I, they charge 99 cents. If you just, if you don't want to buy my course, you don't want to buy anybody's course, you're a security professional, then all you want to do is just pass your exam. Uh, then get that book. It's a quick book. It's like 130 pages or something. It goes through every single one of the exam objective. And it's going to actually go through all the acronyms. So check that out. The links are all in the description below. And I'll see you in the next video.